Hello and welcome back to Unheard. As you can see, we are out of the studio. In fact, we are in a side street next to the Capitol in Washington, D.C. This is the week where the election here in the U.S. really kicked off. We had Super Tuesday, which came very decisively down to Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. We've had the State of the Union. This is very much the beginning of the long campaign. So we have assembled a group of independent thinkers, people from across the political aisle who think a little bit differently, think for themselves. We found kind of a strange studio above a flower store uh, near the Capitol. We're going to have a conversation and try and work out what are the things that everyone agrees on that might be wrong. Welcome to our pop-up studio here in the heart of Washington, D.C. Yes, we've left rainy London and come to equally rainy Washington, D.C. because this week it feels like the election here has really been kick-started. We had Super Tuesday, which only confirmed what everyone presumed, which is that Donald Trump looks certain now to be the Republican candidate. And we've now had the State of the Union, or is happening right about now. So it feels like from here on through to November, the race is fully on. So we have found for you a all-star panel of uh, independent thinking brains from across the political spectrum. Let me just introduce who we have. Emily Jasinski, uh, you are a editor at The Federalist and a star presenter at Breaking Points slash Counterpoint. That's right. Thank you so much. Is that a fair introduction? Fair and overly kind. So maybe not even fair. Too kind. <laughs> um, Robbie, you will recognize from The Rising, uh, also a senior editor at Reason. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And Roy, a brilliant substack you write called Liberal Patriot. And you are one of our interesting crossover uh, candidates here in terms of political background. We're going to let the audience try and work out. Yeah, yeah, see if they can figure it out. <laughs> I think what we want to try and do in the next hour is try and work out, are there aspects of the kind of the mainstream narrative that people have got wrong? So before we can answer that question, Emily, what do you think the, the consensus view is now? The election started. What does everyone think is happening? The consensus, and, and this is also in the same vein of the question that we're getting at, the consensus is that this is a matchup between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, and there's been so little attention paid. There's some flirtation with maybe no labels will run a third party candidate. But I mean, I hate to sound like you know the crazy person here, but Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Mm. has a lot of clout. He has some money. Uh, he's been polling, and this is the most important part, he's been polling very well in some states, and it's early, and it's before he's really started spending and fundraising and all of that. So I think, on the one hand, the consensus is that this is now just a race between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, uh, that it's just going to be a rematch of 2020. The word rematch was just circulating in media over and over again today. Uh, and of course, that's fair to some extent, two major party nominees. But... I continue to think there's a good possibility we're hurtling towards a 1992 Ross Perot spoiler type scenario uh, because Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, has probably more name recognition, uh, more built in goodwill just because of the Kennedy brand uh, and just more seriousness as a third party candidate than we've seen in recent history. He is not Jill Stein and even Jill Stein, as Hillary Clinton will still tell you, uh, made a difference in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin right. in the Electoral College. So how does that actually, we've, you've chosen a great theme there, so let's just dive into it straight away. How does that play out in practicality, the, the RFK scenario? So he, he needs to get on a certain number of states, and basically all he needs is a, f a few percentage points, even if it's the, the polling numbers, which have in some cases shown 20, 25 percent, even if they're way off, mm -hmm. if it was 5 percent, 10 percent, it could make a huge difference. But who does it hurt? Yeah, I actually, I think a lot of people see it as primarily hurting Donald Trump. I actually think it could really hurt Joe Biden uh, because as Republicans start to pivot to RFK Jr., which we've seen a little bit of, their attacks on him are very interesting. The Trump can't pan and RNC attacks that we've seen on RFK Jr. so far are that he's a big government environmentalist. And you know what? that's actually pretty easy to sell <laughs> to some voters. Uh, it's you know the worst thing Robbie's ever heard, uh, but it is true. There are a lot of people in this country that love uh, some of the things that RFK Jr. did, cleaning up the Hudson River, et cetera. Uh, and so I think the more Ugh. RFK Jr. I know <laughs> Robbie hates clean water. Uh, the more he gets attacked uh, by actually by Donald Trump, the more 
he will, you'll see a lot of people on the left taking a, a second look at him. I'm not saying that makes it really easy for him to make his pitch to people on the left, but I, I think the media is missing how easily a lot of people, I mean, I'm from Wisconsin, I can see the type of RFK junior voter that hasn't quite been uh, approached with a solid pitch yet flipping to him over Joe Biden, especially in the wake of October 7th when a lot of young people are exasperated with the Biden administration. Robbie? What do you think of that? Are you, are you sold on the RFK as a big upsetting factor? I think he's going to be a big factor. Whether it's an upsetting factor is another question. I, I tend to think, and I'm a third party voter myself, I generally vote for the Libertarian Party candidate. If RFK Jr. was a Libertarian Party candidate, I'd probably vote for him. My disagreements with his policies on the environment and economics aside, That's interesting. I appreciate... That's I, right. I appreciate what he did on COVID, his opposition to mandates that has yeah. obviously won him some uh, right wing fans and also some independents and disaffected people who used to be Democrats but thought all that went too far. Um, however, the, the third party people or the independent people, including RFK Jr., I think tend to draw um, from a reservoir of voters who are already dissatisfied with the major parties and not inclined to vote mm. for them. Mm. So, you know, is Jill Stein, you know, if she's winning a small number of people, yeah, maybe the margin is small, but is she, if she wasn't in the race and didn't get those people, I think a lot of them would just stay home. Mm. Um, they, they might split more than you think um, for either of the other candidates. So I, so I tend to, the spoiler effect, I'm not sure. And now, if it is a spoiler effect, fine. They, those people deserve it. They can easily, the major parties could do better by speaking to the issues that someone like RFK mm. Jr. represents. So I think he'll have an impact, whether it's, I, I think he will pull, he will, his final performance, if you were looking at the polls, and I think they're probably accurate, will be more seismic than any other third-party candidate in, in recent memory, maybe going back to right. Ross Perot. But if he wasn't there, I think a lot of those people would not vote or divide themselves fairly evenly among the major so candidates. So what would be your kind of nomination then for, for things that we aren't talking enough yeah. about or scenarios that are underpriced in the kind of markets analogy? Well, look, the, the, the media is now paying attention to it, but it is very recent that um, I think the weakness of Joe Biden as a candidate has actually been recognized by uh, mainstream reporters, pundits, Democratic operatives, um, because we heard all these excuses for months. And, well, the po his polls will rebound when it's clear that Donald Trump is actually his opponent. That hasn't happened, even though now it's, it's clear and it's frankly been clear the whole time, but it's especially clear now. Um, or his polls will rebound when the economy, the, the numbers pick up. That's happened. Poll numbers haven't rebounded. Whatever, something has gone wrong. I think it's, on, frankly, the age question, which was un, horrendously undercovered by the mainstream media. It is being covered now. Reporters are grilling Biden at press, when he does press conferences about him trailing off and losing his train of thought and misremembering who the president of, of your, <laughs> the, the, the prime minister of your mm -hmm. country in Germany is. Are we doing this France. podcast from Mexico? Is that right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to build a wall in Gaza and get Mexico to pay for it and we're all going to be really confused. So that is, that is something now the mainstream is paying attention to, but they've discounted it for so long. Even though if you have a conversation outside of Washington, D.C. with a normal, not politically connected person of, of any political stripe, they will tell you nine times out of ten, they think Biden is too old. He looks way older. They're correct, mm. way older than last time, and they're just not sure, regardless of their politics. And that confuses people in the media and in D.C. who are very politically connected and go, but wait, his policies, shouldn't you care about his policies? People, mm. people look at the guy and don't think he's capable but of doing so the job. Case, what is the sort of underpriced scenario? Because it strikes me like that is now the consensus view. I mean, I was just in New York even talking to mm. really died in the world Democrats they think they're going to lose. Uh, so so uh, uh, do you think basically the consensus view is right then and we are sort of gradually headed towards a solid Trump victory? Is that your prediction? Yes. Today? Yes, that is my prediction. Yes. Um, do you think we could be talking landslide territory? Can I? Can I no, I think there'll be that? a narrow, a narrow Trump victory is the most likely scenario. Now, look, it, it remains the case that whenever it comes down to actual voting, including in the midterms, where it looked bad for Joe Biden. His party does better than expected. This has happened a couple times now, so I'm not discounting or counting him out. It, it seems pretty clear that Donald Trump is also a flawed candidate. This was like the last chance we just had Super Tuesday to have some other non-Trump candidate who I think, look, and I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan necessarily of Nikki Haley or, or her policies. I think it's pretty clear she was going to win like a 50-state landslide if she was the general election candidate. That's not an endorsement of her, but... Uh, that's not what that's not mm -hmm. meant to be. Republican primary voters want Trump and they're going to get him. And so it's going to be a very close election. Roy. Yeah, I'm not so sure the consensus is that Biden is going to lose. 
I think the consensus has become Biden can lose. And I think that's one thing that's changed. People were in denial about it in a lot of the media. Yeah, Trump's a little bit ahead now, but as you say, people will focus on the race. Trump will say something crazy. The economy's picking up. But I think that is now nudged over to the side. Oh my God, you know, Trump really could win. And right now he's definitely ahead. And if the election were held today, he probably would win. But I still think in back of that, there's a lot of faith, uh, justified or unjustified, depending on your point of view, that as the race comes more into focus, as the economy improves, as people are really confronted with the Biden-Trump choice, uh, eventually that'll shift back in Biden's direction, give him a better chance of winning. I mean, one thing I'd also add here about the, uh, the third party issue is actually it was true initially that if you pulled RFK Jr. in a race with Biden and Trump, it looked like it might have helped Biden a little bit, but now it looks like it's helping Trump. It actually expands his lead. And then if you throw the rest of these, you know, the rest of the gang in there, you know, Stein and West and all that, the, the, it's even wider lead. So it seems like having those additional candidates in the race like shakes people more off of Biden than, yeah. than Trump at this point. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think to my mind, that's the evolution of the conventional wisdom from, oh, this could never happen. You know, just like people said in 2016, to, oh my God. This really could happen. So can I tempt any of you with the idea that people are being overly confident about Trump? I mean, one thing that we did learn this week to be a bit of a kind of geeky pollster on this is that he underperformed his polls. In pretty much all of the Super Tuesday races, the leads, although huge, mm. and the difference might seem like a bit of a detail, were less than was predicted. The pollsters tend to be wrong in one way or the other. Is it not possible that they're wrong in the other direction this time and that somehow there'll be a, an upset in that direction? Well, remember, the, anyone... the election comes down to just actually five states. So, so where, you know, where Trump stands versus Biden or versus RFK Jr. In, a, in 45 of the 50 states, frankly, doesn't matter. It's what's happening in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, et cetera. That's like that's all that matters. So you, you have to talk to voters there. And Donald Trump ha did not have a good track record in the midterms in those states specifically. The candidates that he handpicked in many cases and then forced to lean heavily into relitigating the previous election cost them all horrendously. So the, yeah, that could still happen. Um, he could just start. You, you know, and also he's going to be. So I don't think the trials. I don't think impact his numbers or support much at all. But it is going to be an issue that he's going to be unable to like go to Michigan and give a speech to auto workers because he's going to have to appear in court somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it's his ability to actually campaign will be hampered by the pace of the trials. And I do think that could make the difference, frankly. Mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton not visiting these places, uh, Pennsylvania and Michigan in 2016, was like the deciding factor. Emily, what do you think then? What would have to happen to Donald Trump to change what appears to this to be this momentum now. Do you, do you agree with Robbie that the, the, the cr criminal cases aren't really going to make a huge difference except a practical one? Is it is it another Democratic candidate? What, what are the what needs to happen to change the story? I mean, the, the worst thing that could happen to Donald Trump is also the best thing that could happen to Donald Trump, which is just Donald Trump. <laughs> you know, Donald Trump needs to be Donald Trump in order to turn out voters in, yeah, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, places where he's made such a concerted effort to be in Michigan, for example, because of the EV situation uh, with auto workers. And he started courting the Teamsters and these different, uh, you know, sort of demographics for Republicans. But at the same time, and this was always Nikki Haley's argument, and she did, to her credit, get 30 to 40 percent of the vote while wildly outspending Trump, to be fair, in some important states. Uh, she was supposed to be appealing to those sort of suburban woman, women, uh, educated suburban people, especially women, who are disaffected by the Republican Party because of Donald Trump. So, if she Donald kind of Trump did appeal to them, didn't she, she? Totally did, absolutely. And if you talk to Nikki Haley voters, as people have been doing, they are not people who say, "I'm going to suck it up and vote for Trump." Now. Donald Trump could maybe win some of those voters if the economy uh, continues to feel like it's flagging for people. But uh, I really think Nikki Haley, or not Nikki Haley, I really think that demographic is, is clearly what's turned off by Trump being Trump. So it's such a tightrope for him to, on the one hand, 
get the turnout that he needs in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, while also uh, getting the turnout he needs from the suburbs. It's very, it's a very, very close tight. So you think that's walk. where it could, in theory, go wrong? Donald Trump, and you saw this last night, if you're watching like Fox News on Super Tuesday, people were almost cheering him on to not mention Nikki Haley and to be somewhat reserved and restrained and to <laughs> seem like a serious politician. It was like, you could feel people pulling for him. Um, and you know, for Trump, I guess, on the scale of you know Trump, it was <laughs> maybe in the middle. Uh, it wasn't, he didn't go full Trump, uh, but he almost certainly will, especially with all of these law lawsuits that understandably grind his gears uh, and set him off on Truth Social. Right. But isn't it better for him to talk about those trials than to talk about the 2020 election? I mean, that's the, there's an opportunity benefit for, for him to talk about those trials because people do see it as a political vendetta. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there's some truth to this. I mean, they have thrown everything but the kitchen sink at him. Um, and people don't understand these trials. They're like, what the hell is going on? Didn't he get charged a trillion dollars for some deal that nobody got hurt by? So um, I think that's a little bit easier to rev up his base by talking about than he, he wants, you know, there's a tug, there's a pull back toward talking about the 2020 election. I'm just stolen. You know, and this really doesn't work that well, even with his base at this point, right? So, but I think the idea that the elites and the Democrats are after him, they tried to throw him off the Colorado ballot. I mean, these skunks, you know, why don't they want you to be able to vote for the candidate you support? I think that's much more effective. So I think that's actually, that's a good side of all these trials going on. The bad side is if he gets, you know, the opportunity cost, maybe he's got to go to, you know, some trial as opposed to campaigning in Wisconsin. Um, I think there's also a possibility that, well, he could get convicted, you know, yes, and, and yes. we know from a lot, there are a lot of poll questions that show a significant portion of Trump supporters, you know, sort of on uh, top line Trump supporters saying, eh, maybe I wouldn't vote for him then. But I don't know if that would happen. I don't happen. know if I believe them, I don't frankly. know if I believe them either, <laughs> but I'm just saying at least that's some data that suggests there's some there yeah. there. So talking about data, mm -hmm. the, the, a lot of it is not that interesting when people are kind of digging into opinion polls and who voted for who. But one story really is significant, which is something you've made a bit of a special study of, which is minority groups mm -hmm. who stereotypically you imagine are going to be voting Democrat are moving over to Trump and not just one by one. It feels like in their droves. We did a story on Unheard, which said that right. in the last four years, the New York Times estimated in 2020 that 4% of African-Americans went Trump and their latest estimate is 23%. Mm -hmm. Is it true, and why is it happening if so? Well, the way I like to look at this is, look at the working class, look at the non-college voters within the minority you know, sector of voters, non-white working class voters. Huge shifts, right? I mean, that's what drove the Hispanic shift in 2020. That's what drove the, you know, generally speaking, the non-white shifts toward the Republicans. If you look at 2012, Obama carries non-white working class voters by 67 points. OK, uh, Hillary Clinton carries them by 60. Biden in his first election carried them by 48. So we're already down 19 points on that, you know, in that uh, demographic, even while he's improving among white college educated voters, about a 16 point improvement over Obama in 2012. And then if you look at it today with his latest Times poll, six point lead, six points among non-white working class voters. That is atrocious. Yeah, you know, okay, it's one poll, but it's not that inconsistent with a lot of other polling data uh, imp why, implies, at least. Because why they do you think that is? I just think they think, uh, you know, Trump did a pretty good job in the economy. They don't think the Democrats have done a very good job. The inflation spike really freaked people out. Um, and there's a general sense among a lot of these voters that the Democratic Party is concerned with other issues that don't connect that closely to the material day-to-day -day welfare. You know, they're not the party of the working class anymore, uh, including me, the non-white working class. It's more the party of those educated people who hang out in places like we are, who are concerned with trans rights and, uh, you know, open borders and, you know, sort of disparate impact of enforcing the law. And, you know, just like stuff they don't understand. I mean, to the extent they even know about it, they, they don't understand why people would have these points of view. And they think the Democrats are associated with them and they think that's bad. So, they think so actually, it's not that you think these minority groups are kind of riled up by what Biden or the Democrats are saying about these culture war issues. It's more that you think they just, they're irrelevant, they're uninteresting. Well, I think they're, they're either indifferent or hostile. I mean, I think it's, it's a fair statement that 
most non-white working class voters aren't going to vote in the you know, sort of trans issues, whether you know, biological males should participate in a girl's team. But they, they think it's dumb and they're opposed to it. Um, and it just adds to this image of the Democrats as not being their kind of party, not being on their side, not sharing their view of the world, and probably looking down on them because, you know, I don't really think it's a great idea for biological guys to play in girls' teams or whatever, right? MSNBC um, last night, they were laughing in the face of voters in Virginia who care about immigration. I mean, it's just like the most uh, atrocious display yeah, perfect example. of uh, ignorant elitism. And we've been, had, what, almost a decade since 2016 at this point for the media to make the course correction. And what they've done is sprinted in the opposite direction. And I, that, that does really, that was Jen Psaki, not even a journalist. She's, she was a spokesperson for Biden. Uh, she's, a, she's a visible sort of surrogate for Biden. And I'm not saying that's you know, being pinged around the Rio Grande Valley right now. Um, but actually, in some places, it probably is. And that does, that's social media. That goes to TikTok. That goes to Instagram. And these are out of control of the Biden campaign. It's just the way that uh, people are treated by elites in media can make them think about things differently. I have been like jaw on the floor astounded by some of the, the numbers that Roy has written about, um, the way that they're showing up. I don't know if they're durable. I don't know if they show up in elections. One of the things that saved Biden and Democrats in 2020 and 2022 was this massive surge of young voters. I mean, I shouldn't say massive, but a significant surge of young voters in states like Pennsylvania. And that was really helpful. But now you have the post-October 7th sort of atmosphere around Joe Biden. Um, that could, you know, it's at the margins. It'll probably be a close election. So these little things that add up at the margins, whether it's Hispanic voters in the Rio Grande Valley saying, actually, I'm going to go for, vote for Trump, young voters saying that they're going to stay home, uh, that's not a recipe for a comfortable election season right. for the Democrats. Robbie, if Roy and Emily are right that these groups are abandoning Biden, and, and it's an if, we don't yet know, it's kind of an amazing result after four years of this, isn't it? Because th these, these ideas, the DEI, the, all of these, what are called these culture war issues were supposed to appeal to precisely those voters. And it doesn't look like it worked. Right, I mean, I, I agree with them both. I think it's, look, it's a vibe, man. It's, uh, it's a vibe and um, what the Democrats have come to represent in the eyes of so many of these voters in terms of wokeness, DEI, we used to call it political correctness. We even you know, had 1,800 different terms for this, but uh, the Democrats are associated with it and it's politically toxic. Uh, but, but I, so I think that's all true, but I will again say, I think the age thing is, is, the, is the tipping point factor. And we have never had a president this old, who we've never had a president that appears this visibly old, that the, the, the job of presidency, frankly, at this point, is a communications role because he has advisors who are actually making policy. His job is to be on TV. He needs to be able to, to read a speech from an auto cue. He, he needs to be able to finish his train of thought when he's asked about, well, so is there a ceasefire deal? And, and then he has to, you see the reporters in the room actually help him say, with Hamas, that's what we're talking about. This is it's this like is the words for him. this is non-political almost. Like right. again, talk to people who don't pay attention to politics professionally the way we all do. You know, we're paid to do this; it's our jobs. Mm -hmm. But ordinary people don't have. I've often found this don't sometimes don't have consistent political views on things because they don't. It's not their job to think through these things. Mm -hmm. It's our job. They some of what they decide is based on personality, how the person looks on TV, whether they empathize with the person or the, they think the person empathizes with them. Biden arguably did a very good job of this at the end of COVID, being a, a sympathetic figure, someone who had experienced personal tragedy, and frankly wasn't who who was at that point projecting I think more stability than Donald Trump was. Trump was so frustrated that his somewhat successful first term was being derailed by this out of nowhere pandemic mm -hmm. he didn't have control over and it showed when he communicated on tv about it that he careened wildly from we have to take this seriously and shut everything down no people don't like this let's let's open everything up i'm just going to do what my advisors say actually i'm turning on my advisors because now i'm realizing the base doesn't like them it was it was chaotic and biden did a good job of appealing to stability but four years later he looks like your grandfather's mm. or your great grandparents at a time when like they should be retired, not mm. not making decisions for the country. And if you talk to people outside DC, every person thinks that, and it will cost Biden this race. Okay, I'm getting unnerved because there's a higher degree of agreement than I uh, <laughs> would have liked. Where could we all be wrong here? I mean, mm -hmm. for example, no one has mentioned abortion or mm -hmm. these those kind of issues that a lot of people on the Democratic side feel could really count come election day. 
what's your view on that, Emily? I mean, it's been talked about for, kind of for the last two years as this thing that was going to really move the dial and get people out and change the story. It hasn't really shown up yet, but maybe it still could. You know, I think it, it will matter, especially in down ballot races. And I think there was evidence in 2022, for example, in Michigan, Alyssa Slotkin's race, that abortion galvanized, mobilized, actually brought people to the polls who maybe wouldn't have voted otherwise. And presidential, you know, you're usually going to have the higher turnout than a midterm. You're always going to have a higher turnout than a midterm. Uh, but are the abortion voters already upset with Biden over October 7th, uh, does that neutralize some of the natural advantage that he would have in that case? And Donald Trump has been uh, sort of a moderating force on the Republican Party when it comes to abortion. After the Alabama ruling came out on IVF, he immediately made a statement saying we support IVF, that he supported IVF. He's been uh, working behind the scenes with his, some of his advisors who want to land on a 15-week policy uh, that they have lots of talking points for, that it moves us closer to the European norm. Uh, and Donald Trump is, is different than some of these other candidates around the country in that respect. So it's possible that in different localities... Because he's not a social conservative, actually, at all. No, he's sort of temperamentally a cultural conservative on, like, wokeness, but on policy, if it's, you know, if you're talking about abortion... He's, he's kind of always been icked out by it. He had a fantastic moment with Hil Hillary Clinton in a debate, just politically, whatever you think of abortion, this moment was so powerful uh, and it was so Trumpian and, and in a successful way. And on the, the other side of the double side of the Trump coin, where he said she wants to allow babies to be ripped out of the womb. And he like really resonated with it and it resonated with people. For whatever reason, Donald Trump has navigated the abortion issue better than most elected Republicans or most Republican candidates. So while some of these down ballot races, uh, Democrats are really excited that Mark Robinson was uh, the nominee for governor in North Carolina last night because he's basically a Facebook boomer, like a Christian Facebook boomer, <laughs> uh, who has you know this long string of weirdly worded uh, conspiratorial Facebook posts. Um, and Democrats are like, this is a race that we can get people out to the polls. We will now win a governorship in North Carolina um, that would have gone red. So maybe it makes a difference to have crazy candidates in certain areas, uh, candidates that are seen as crazy in certain areas. But Donald Trump himself has been has handled that adeptly, surprisingly adeptly. So, Robbie, you're about, about yeah. To say well, here's something in. I will say that's maybe contrary to commonly accepted wisdom right now. I am a little bit skeptical, frankly, that um, that Biden's support for Israel and, and October 7th, that is clearly progressives don't like it and the left doesn't like it. I am skeptical that that matters at all. Um, what, a handful of angry left activists who are always upset anyway, are they matter? Do they? I don't think so, frankly. I don't. They're never happy. Mm. The candidate has never it's not left enough. a dividing enough. line between them. Well, either. they're always. It's never enough for them. He could. He could give them everything they want, and he. He would say they. They would be still. It's be a unhappy. progressive they're activist a, group. A part, a yeah, sort of who cares? slice of voters. Yeah. I mean, according to Pew, they're about like eight percent of voters. They skew young, yeah. and these are the voters from all these issues are the same. You know, um, stopping climate change, free Palestine. You know, yay for DEI. You know, racial reparation. I mean, it's all you know, mushed together into this gigantic progressive blob. And those are the people who are out there, by and large, I think, uh, protesting about the Gaza stuff, most animated by it. But they're not, I mean, only like, I think, 10 or 11% of even voters under 30 qualify as being part of this, this group. So uh, I guess I'm kind of with Robbie. I don't think that is going to make that much difference. And do I they think go by it in any way when it comes down to it? I think, they'll, or they, you know, some of them won't vote, but they might not have voted anyway, right? Yes. I mean, at the margin, what is the difference? they would have voted for Jill Stein anyway. What is the difference? I mean, not. I just think at the margin, this is not going to be a big factor. I think the abortion thing is more important, and it could help Biden, and I mean, in general, it'll help him, but the way it could really help him, and this is hard to do, don't try this one at, at home, folks, they you need Goldilocks turnout, right? They had the right kind of turnout because the Democrats are now a high turnout party. They benefit from high turnout because they're the most educated, engaged voters who something like abortion rights just, you know, attracts them to the polls like a magnet. 
right? So um, that's great, but in a presidential election, everybody shows up, or many more people show up, all the peripheral voters. So, and the peripheral voters at this point are leaning against the Democrats, leaning toward Trump, and they're just not that ideological, right? They're not, not like, you know, Trump didn't say exactly the right thing about abortion rights. I'll never vote for him, you know, yay for, for you know, free to choose. Um, that's just not where they're coming from. Uh, and so, but what the Democrats need then, it's going to be a higher turnout election, but they want most of that higher turnout to be made up of their kind of voters, right? Uh, relatively educated, relatively liberal. We're doing some speculation. I want to now move it forward. If the general tenor of this is right, and mm -hmm. if it looks like it stacks up to a likely Trump victory, what happens then? I know it's far away, but this is what I want to think about, because as I said, I just was in New York talking to a lot of Democrats, and. I feel, and this is purely anecdotal, I feel the mood is different. There is a much greater sense of acceptance or resignation. Uh, just they would be depressed about what they see as the, oh, as, about the coming so Trump to, the coming of Hitler, would, they, like, yeah. would they take to the streets every Saturday with not my yeah. president signs? Mm -hmm. would, would the same kind of outrage and energy that we saw in 2016 come back? That's my first question to you. What do you think? How does the left and how do mainstream Democrats respond if Trump wins? I mean, they all have long COVID and they're afraid to leave their homes or something. Like, they, no, there will be, it, it won't be the same kind of energy because he's already been president. And look, you can be, you know, have differences or dislike a lot of what he did. I certainly have my own criticisms of him, but it was not, there was more continuity than anything. It was, Trump is, is uh, I think there's a point you've made or various people have made this, like the things he says are 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 like outside the norm of American politics, but the way the governing went was not even fundamentally different from a normal Republican. He also says different things about foreign policy. The foreign policy was a little bit different. He says things about trade and maybe there are some tariffs that are in place that wouldn't have necessarily been in place if it was a different president. By and large, it was continuity. It wasn't all that wild. And I think frankly, people, even people who don't like him, this whole idea that oh, he's going to accidentally press the nuclear button or something that was kind of the, you know, the run up to 2016. I think we've all been disabused of that. Mm. And yet I've quietly heard just it's starting to bubble up this from both the left and the right. So some conservatives see this as a bad thing and some liberals, many liberals, I think, are terrified of this. It's, it's probably more common on the left right now, which is Donald Trump, if he gets a second term, is totally un fettered by the need to run for president again. So conservatives, I've heard talking about that in the sense that, well, he'll just tack totally to the center uh, because, you know, how much of this did he ever really believe, et cetera. The left, though, in places like MSNBC, has said this could lead to, uh, you know, a heightened constitutional crisis. What does Donald Trump do when he doesn't have to run for election again? Uh, we saw when he was trying to hold on to power on January 6th, what could this look like down the road? I'm not, you know, weighing in on that either way. I think Donald Trump actually is extremely hard to predict, although I err on the side of Robbie that, like, his first term didn't look, you know, like a lot of people predicted it would. Exactly. Where's Quite literally the Hitler. the Minister of yes, State? Where's the fire? Like, we want this. The no, idea they're going to do it, this is never, never going to do it. It's never going to happen. And Trump yeah. people delude themselves and thinking, oh, well, now we get a second term, he's going to give us everything we want. No, it's not going to so, happen. But, I'll stop. I'll stop. So this has been, the, the, like, actually, it has been a big, in the last couple of weeks, we've heard constantly after he made a flippant comment about NATO, uh, which, again, he didn't dissolve NATO in his first term. He did, you know, in, induce some different payments from uh, people in, in Europe. Which but, has already happened very dramatically since right? his era. Right. I mean, he could feasibly chalk that up as a success already, I would have thought. Absolutely. And so does he, you know, totally dissolve NATO? This has been the panic that we've already heard echoing in some liberal corners uh, before, you know, Nikki Haley was even finally out of the race. So I could see that becoming a galvanizing factor in the way the uh, Women's March latched on to the uh, Access Hollywood tape. I could see that. But in which case, maybe that, Roy, is the underpriced scenario we're looking for that Trump wins and it's kind of boring. Uh, I mean, if the, if the Democrats and, and people on the sort of liberal left are not that excited by it, they're just gonna kind of close their eyes and hold their breath for four years and Trump may end up doing quite mainstream things. That, I don't think people have thought about that, that maybe Trump too could be a kind of non-event. Well, non-event is probably overstating the case, I think, but um, I think a lot depends on how he handles it in the very, you know, first part of his administration and what he says even leading up to being inaugurated. Because uh, there is a significant chunk of the left 
who will basically treat this as, you know, Hitler is now the chancellor, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it was Weimar 1932, now it's Weimar 1933, you know, Katie bar the door, he's going to be a dictator, he's going to destroy the civil service, he's going to abrogate the constitution. Um, so the more he says and does, does some things at least that seem in that ballpark, the more they can keep the hysteria going, right? And maybe the right to do so, I don't know. But to the extent that he kind of holds himself back and doesn't say things that are really crazy, he just like pushes back or you know, gets rid of some policies that weren't very popular anyway, that the Democrats were behind. I think, I think then you have a kind of interesting scenario where kind of like what you're saying, he's, he's just like, it's another Trumpian presidency where he's saying some crazy stuff, but a lot of what he does isn't that insane. And some of it might even be supported by uh, like normie voters. And, and then Democrats have to figure out, well, now what do we do? Not only can't Trump run for president anymore, we can't run against Trump again. So who is our party? We just lost the working class in this last election. And that's why Donald Trump is our president today by 20 points. You know, what, who are we? Mm. What do we really stand for? I mean, people didn't like what we did. So what are we going to tell them we're going to do in the future? How are we going to beat the Trumpian Republican Party? especially a Trumpian Republican Party that, it, let's say, you think at the margin, Trump's craziness, well, maybe a little bit appealing in some ways because he's like, uh, people like the fact he says it like it is, but on net, maybe it hurts the Republicans, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, Trump can't run again. It's going to, the Republican Party is going to evolve in the next four years. They're now the populist party. What do we do? You know, I mean, what if they get a saner populist to, mm -hmm. to, take, to take the reins here? I mean, we've got to figure out how to compete. Okay. Um, and, you know, they basically, they took back the Senate, which I think is very likely to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, all of this is irresponsible speculation. That's we what we're here for. That's, that's what we what like we're to here do. For, but, <laughs> the uh, final question I'm going to throw out okay. before we conclude this, this uh, hour is, again, I want to just make sure, because I feel we've been somewhat Trump, softly Trump positive mm -hmm. in the last hour. Well, let's Trump positive in the sense we think he has a very, a very good, good chance, chance of, of, of success. Okay. Let's paint the worst case scenario. We're, we're being chipper here in this beautiful music studio. What kind of disaster might be around the corner that we're not fully conscious of? Is it the, the overly tight outcome which leads to some major constitutional calamity? Is it a Trump victory that goes, that he really or loses? Or a Biden the victory that is or not is denied by victory? Trump and he gets his people out in the streets? Yeah. Do you think that's feasible? Absolutely. Or he yeah. wins and gets convicted of a crime yeah. before or after. I mean, he's on yeah. the cusp of victory and has a, a serious legal setback, whether that means he, I think it's hard for them given these legal timelines to uh, speed them up and, and actually end up where there would be a conviction and, and Donald Trump would be preparing for prison uh, in the next several so months. So that's not who would be president from prison. Or what? <laughs> this is this is the thing. I mean, some of these cases carry serious sentences and are set to be determined within the next year. So if it's on the cusp of the election that and a decision comes down that is not favorable towards Donald Trump, that is uh, almost I mean, th that's people from the right on the street. Uh, that's you, you get almost a potential another January 6th. Robbie, what what nightmare scenarios have we not considered properly? <sighs> He wins, and then the Democrats um, decide not to um, certify his election. And in fact, some have already indicated, uh, I think Adam Schiff, Jamie Raskin, they've said, well, their standpoint is that he is insurrect an insurrectionist and he's ine ineligible to be president. So would they, I mean, they, they've, you know, they impeached him on that basis. So would they actually do their version of January 6th, uh, which would touch off a major constitutional crisis? I agree with Emily that it would be a constitutional crisis if he wins and then is convicted and imprisoned, which is a totally possible situation. His legal uh, jeopardy in, I think, particularly the Georgia case, is extreme. And I, frankly, I don't think his supporters have reckoned with the fact. They don't have to like it. They don't have to agree with it. But the fact remains that in Georgia, they have charged not just Trump, but a number of other people who will all flip for in order to get lighter sentences and say the way it goes in Rico that this was a criminal conspiracy orchestrated by this man and when I falsified this document and I when I met with these people and when we had this scheme, we were doing it because Trump told us to do it. That will be highly difficult for him. 
So yeah. we, we are, we are uh, the, the way to uh, avoid that kind of crisis is to have Joe Biden cleanly win the election. And then Trump people will be mad at whatever becomes of Trump's ultimate legal fate. But to have Trump win and this stuff happen, That's which is like a 30% chance maybe, mm -hmm. is going to be very bad for this country. Emily, Roby, Roy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was our hastily assembled little brains trust here in the heart of Washington, D.C., just a few blocks from the Capitol. We're above a flower store. But I thought what they had to say was really interesting. We were trying to consider different scenarios. What are the underpriced scenarios? What might happen that people aren't giving enough attention to? And alternatively, what are our own biases? What are we ourselves missing? That's the key question to keep asking. What are we missing? Well, if you thought we missed things, let us know in the comments. As ever, in the meantime, from Washington, D.C., this was Unheard.